during worship, just what I experienced was, um, you know, I, I, I had that, uh, the, or the picture of Moses and the Israelites standing in front of the Red Sea, and that sea is lying there, and, and the people are going, but Moses, we are going to die. The Israelites are coming. There's water, you know, we, we're all just going to die. You know, maybe that's what you feel like this morning. You know, you feel that it looks absolutely impossible in front of you. It feels like there's no way out. There's no way through. You cannot see how you or your business or your family will survive beyond, uh, you know, lockdown. And who knows how long it's still going to take. But this morning, I just want to encourage you. Because I believe what God is saying, trust me, as I go before you. Now, I don't think the focus is on a specific man at this time. But the focus is on God Almighty. You see, because Mo Moses was the instrument in God's hand, yes. And he stretched out his staff and the, the, the sea opened and the Israelites uh, went through. And the scripture says on dry ground. They walked through. Um, but he was just the instrument in God's hand. And I want to encourage you that, that you just look at God. You watch God as he performs miracles in your lives at this time. So don't be afraid. Don't be concerned. Look out and watch for God to move at, at, in your life at this time. Don't look at the sea. Don't look at the impossibility of the matter. But look to God and he will show you his mighty ways. Hi, Kubus. Thank you very much. And um, everyone in our church and everyone is listening. Um, certainly a privilege this morning for me to speak. And yes, I'm looking forward to share the word with you this morning. My title this morning is, I've given them your word. Now, what does that mean if someone says I've given, if someone gives you their word? Um, I'm sure at this time, if President Cyril Ramaphosa was to be able to give us his word that lockdown would end, we would all be very happy and um, would like to trust him for that. Um, unfortunately, we don't know that for sure, and God alone knows, I believe. But um, so at this time, when we think about the title, what, it's, what it means if I say to you, I give you my word, um, I won't speak to anyone about this, it means I'm putting my integrity out there. And um, it will prove me true to my word or not, if I'm going to do what I'm saying or not. And uh, so we're going to speak about that a bit today. I hope you guys can hear me clearly and that you can enjoy just sitting back and listening to it. Well, I just pray, Father God, this morning, I pray, Father, that just the words that we hear, Lord God, it's your words, Father. And as we listen to your words, we acknowledge that it's you, Father, and it's through your spirit that we can get changed alone, Father God. So, Father, I just commit this time to you in Jesus' name. So these words, um, I've given them your word. If God says that in the Bible, and the, the message I want to come and bring this morning is really about two things. I think what we can do with God's word. And firstly, it is that um, he's given us his word so that we can know him. He's, he's given us his word so that we can believe in him for who he is. And you see the, the picture of, of wedding rings and, and a word, the Bible there. So a picture we are all familiar with is, is a wedding where the bride and the groom exchange their vows. They give each other, um, so to speak, as, as, as to, um, in reality, they give an oath before God, before witnesses, to be true to, to what they say, that they can be loyal to each other. Um, so marriage and God giving us his word is really a beautiful picture that through his word, we can know him. It's like marriage being in relationship with God. It's this covenant. We can know him through his word. We can believe him. And secondly, I believe that the word for us, why he's given us his word, is so that we can become like him. We can become like God and like Jesus in the process. Now, we certainly... I think there's a lot about that out there and we all feel that urgency that this is a time that we as Christians are called for. We call for a time like this to be witnesses and 
my message today is that to be witnesses for Jesus in this world is a joyful thing. It's not a heavy thing. It's not a forced thing. And um, I trust that something in that will, will break this morning as we speak. That something will, will happen in our hearts that we realize that his word is enough. And knowing him is enough to be effective witnesses for Jesus in this time, in this world. So <clears throat> I did a, a bit of interesting research and it's about um, morals and virtues. So I started a statement and it's in our Bible school, second year Bible school module. It says neutrality is not an option. <clears throat> and basically saying that in, in, this, in this module, it speaks about Christians in society and um and for us to be a change in society i think we can't be neutral so it's speaking to the verse it says that we're not we can't hide our light under a lamp um or under a bushel instead let's let's put it on the lamp let's shine our light and um and that's so true in this time the interesting um Thing and, and, and when we speak about us as Christians in society, it speaks a lot about um, virtues or morals. Because when we when we in society, it's, it's a lot of people together. And for us to get along together um, as people, it means that yeah, we need to behave in a certain way. We need to have the right behavior to. Um, to get along and to be part of society. Um, otherwise, you'll be an outcast or whatever. And the interesting um, findings and um, things that I've, I've, I've read about just vir virtues and morality is that actually the, the, the Catholic Church, they recognize four cardinal virtues, as they speak about them. Maybe let's just define morality, morality or virtues. Um, <clears throat> and what it actually is, so it says in the Oxford Dictionary that it's the principles of right and wrong behavior, right? So right and wrong behavior is, is that's the principles on which society gauges, um, sort of judges each other, I guess, and get along. So um, these four cardinal vir virtues, these are sort of what I speak about as these aren't the only virtues. There are lots of virtues in the, in the world. Um, things like honesty, being helpful, um, respecting someone, a lot of that stuff that they say. And this is also apparently from the ancient Greeks, philosophers and guys. They recognize as these are the four key main virtues that all the other virtues sort of hinge on. Um, quickly to go through them, it's prudence. Prudence is really just that soberness, um, to be sensible about things that you do, thinking of, thinking through what, you, what you're doing and what you're saying. Um, temperance. Temperance is really knowing your limits. It's um, when you think about drinking and food and so on, not going overboard, also in the way that you speak, um, but also not, it's also speaking about not going not underdoing it, also not overdoing it. Fortitude speaks about um, really courage. And it's that courage to do what is right, courage to, to, to live a good, good life. And then justice, the last one is really just speaking about fairness, fairness in, in the world and towards others. Now these are, these are virtues that, um, you know, the world, everyone plays by. It, doesn't mean, doesn't matter who you are. Um, it's sort of the global, the universal recognized uh, virtues. And the, and the challenge, and I've been, I've been wrestling with this a bit, just about how are we different in this world? And, um, you know, the world and people out there, they do often, there's a lot of people that do all those things much, much better than what I can. Um, being a very morally good person. But is that enough? And 
how we um, have to try and pertain to that. Now, the, the interesting part is that there's a second set of virtues also recognized, and that is what they call the theo theological virtues. And it's on the screen there, it's faith, charity, and hope. And charity really, it was an old word, um, and it's changed a bit over time, but it really speaks about love. So faith, love, and hope. It's a kind of charity that goes with forgiveness, goes with action, um, and that sort of thing. Um, and my, my conviction is just that if we're going to um, be different, we're going to have to be different in all of those, but including definitely the theological virtues. Um, yeah, so the, they say, certain people say that morals not necessarily has to be taught so much as it has to be reminded of. We all know about these things, but it's good to be reminded of it. To those, to those words about God's word, he's given us his word to remind us of virtues, of godly virtues. And if the cardinal virtues are being relied in relationship with people, uh, the theological virtues is with God and with people. And that's something that the world doesn't have. Okay. I just want to confirm that with the scripture that I found confirming to me is in Romans 12, 12 verse 9 to 21, really. You can read it. It's not on the screen, but that, that's, that portion is marked as marks of a true Christian. And it starts with the words, let your love be without hypocrisy, or let your love be genuine. So that's love. It speaks about those theological virtues for me. And then it goes on, and here in verse 17, it says, it speaks about, for me, very much about those other virtues. It speaks, it says, in the Amplified Version, I'm just going to read it for you. It says, repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is honest and proper and noble, aiming to be above reproach in the sight of everyone. We know we need to love our neighbor, we need to do all those things. We need to also be seen as, as acceptable, proper, out there in the world. Um, okay, so Romans 12, verse 9 to 21, you can read that for yourself. But today we're going to focus on John 17, and Quibus also um, touched on it last week. <clears throat> so we're going to get right into that. And it's, it's a part where Jesus, it's, it's the background of Jesus going to the cross and he's with his disciples and he goes to pray for his disciples. And um, in verse 9 it says that I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you, you have given me, for they are yours. So this is really showing that as Jesus was so fervently praying, and you can, when you read this portion, you can really just hear the love and the, really the, um, uh, God, his feeling towards his people, his disciples, who is sending out into his world. And um, so it's really a prayer where that speaks about our identity. And identity is so crucial in us knowing who we are in this time knowing who God is. So let me skip a few verses and go, go to verse 13. We're going to read verse 13 up to 17, I think. And I'm just going to break it down for us as we read it. It says there in verse 13, But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world. Now just to stop there, Jesus is saying to God, I'm coming to you, and the things that I'm speaking to you, that's his words. And we know everything that God, that Jesus spoke, he just spoke what the Father showed him. Um, so he spoke God's word throughout his life, throughout his ministry. And then he says, from the world is coming. He's speaking it in the world. And the world, in, as we know in the New Testament, it always refers to a world society um, being opposed to God. 
of being alienated, not knowing God. <clears throat> then we read on, it says that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. This is so beautiful part. Um, Quibus sermon last week as well, and that's in John 16 and 14. It's exactly the same. Jesus there said, I, I give them these words that they may have peace. And I says, I give them these words, they may have joy. And we saw last week that it's based, that peace and joy is really based on believing in his words. Um, believing his words and, and what he says to us, that we may have peace in this world and joy. And it's so wonderful, our Christian um, liberty and freedom and joy that we have in being witnesses for him. I mean, yeah, it's often it gets distorted and we, we get wrong messages, but the truth is that it is a joy. Jesus died for us, he forgave us, you know, we can't do it in ourselves. Um, certainly not, we're not perfect. And um, so it's, it's, it's really a wonderful thing and a joyful thing to wish and to witness. He then says that I have given them your word. And it's as if it is a key to, to the prayer that Jesus is praying in. It says, I've given them your word. But then there's a bit of a twist. It says, Jesus says that the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I'm not of the world. So us, it can really be a, a sort of a, a test this, that yes, we need to witness, we need to um, go out with joy and, and love the world. But, and, the, and, and the world even recognizes those virtues, godliness. But um, the truth is they're going to hate us for it because we're not from this world, we're different. And people don't like people being different, I think. Probably the, the reason for it, but it's really a, an evil that it's a spiritual thing. It doesn't make sense. It's not, it doesn't, it's not logical. Why would people hate us for that? For loving um, these good things. But Jesus also prayed there in another part and he says, that, I just pray that, that he keeps us from evil, that God keeps us from evil. And I think that's referring to that. And we go on. There's 15 that... Jesus prays and he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, we may sometimes wish we could have just gone, but the, the, showing us that Jesus was wanting us to be in this world. He could have taken us when he died and he overcame death. He could have, he could have just removed us. <clears throat> from the world, but no, he, he says, I'm not going to take them with, I'm, I'm going to um, send them out in this world, but I pray God that you keep them from evil. Verse 16 says, they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. It's really confirming our identity, um, that we are different from this world, and then sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. So connecting again to that, he has given us his word. Everything he spoke was God's word. And how wonderful that his word is the truth. And that is what sanctifies us. Our definition is quickly there of sanctification. <clears throat> Strong's definition then says that in that context, the Greek verse, the word is hagios, make holy. Um, purify, consecrate, or to venerate. So that sounds like a lot of <clears throat> very big words and sounds very Greek. Um, but the truth is, I think what it comes down to is to change. To change for the good, to change to become holy, be sanctified by God's word. So, I'm going to skip to the, the end of, of Jesus' prayer. 
And at the end, Jesus prays really for for his disciples to, <clears throat> to know God, to be known by him, and to be filled with the love of God. Now we know that, that God and love is, is synonym, it's the same thing. And um, when we go out in society and we're going to be different from the world, and we have to look at those three virtues, um, faith, love, and hope. We know that even in 1 Corinthians 13, it says that love um, being the most important of those. Uh, we know that God says that that's his greatest commandment is to love. So let's just read that. It says that, O righteous Father, in verse 25, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. <clears throat> okay, so really God saying, Jesus saying that the world doesn't know this kind of love, and they don't know God, they don't, they don't, they don't, they don't know this <laughs> godliness. It's something foreign to the world. Um, now, we might ask, how is, how is faith and love and those things of virtue um, or hope of virtue different from, from what the world is, for instance? And yeah, it's only God that can, can pour that sort of um, virtue into us and that, 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 that sort of thing in our hearts. I explain it, C.S. Lewis explains it in a way that he says that, um, that a virtue is something, or well, these godly virtues are something that we receive by grace. We know faith Jesus has given us by grace. And that something like faith, love, and hope, it's based on our intellect or on reasoning. But then it goes further from that, and that's where it becomes a virtue. So as long as something is just knowledge and intellect, um, it doesn't really qualify it as a virtue. But once we are there in circumstances, so you've now already figured out in your mind that you need to love, you believe, um, we have faith, that, faith in God, and we have hope, and that hope speaking about the eternal hope that we will be with God one day. Now, when circumstances contradict what you believe, and you see something different, and you're in a situation today um, showing you that there is no hope, circumstances are difficult. We worry about our next generation, our children, in this time, even. It's in that way. They said, all reasoning says there's no hope, but you continue to hope, then that becomes a virtue. That becomes something godly inside of you. And that's what we need to trust for, um, I think, as, as believers, as Christians in this time. So I'm just going to finish off. I'm going to sort of end it off um, with the uh, a different view, a story from the Old Testament out of Hosea. And it's an interesting book. And Hosea was a prophet that um, spoke to Israel, the tribe of Israel, or the nation of Israel, which we know as the, the top half, and then we had Judah at the bottom. And he came to warn them before. Israel went into exile, um, the Jews were taken, um, they are banished. So he comes and warns them of many things, but basically about their unfaithfulness towards God, not being really devoted to God. Um, they split the kingdom into two, one their own king, had other gods, they had worship with the uh, pagans and all, all kind of things. As we know, and Isaiah, he came sort of with a loving 
way, but he came to warn them and to tell them and to sort of beg from them to return to God, to not go into, into exile. And the, the, the story out leaves and starts out in the book, it starts about how that God tells Isaiah to be, um, to go and marry a prostitute. And that this will be a message to, to the Israelites of how their behavior is unfaithful, that he, the husband of God, remains loving and faithful towards us. I'm going to read that, that verse. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much. But Isaiah 1 verse 2 says there that um, when the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Isaiah, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute, so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshipping other gods. So that's the, the introduction, and that's from there, then he starts to prophesy and he starts to give pictures and words to Israel. He actually goes and marries a prostitute, um, and I've forgotten her name now. Um, in, anyways, um, she has three children, and yeah, she's unfaithful. She keeps on going back to other men, and so on and so on. And then we read reading as uh, three verse three. It says that that um, then I said to her, "You must live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution." As now as I was speaking to her. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone, not even with me. And this speaks to a time of, of disciplining and the sort of foreshadowed uh, the exile that God was going to bring unto Israel to um, not even know God, not even her own husband she could, she could be intimate with. And how that Israel was would have been taken out of um, everything, out, out of their comfort. And oh, here we see something about disciplining. And what is disciplining? Disciplining is, is a place where we get taught and we get to appreciate what we don't have, really. We get to appreciate um, God and, and knowing, knowing God and His love. So that's just an example. Gomer was the Wife's name, thank you, my wife. I know, my lovely wife. Um, and then two other verses just, just confirming that in Isaiah. It says in Isaiah 5 15, that I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face and in their distress earnestly seek me. Isaiah 6 verse 6, it says, I want to show love. I want you to show love. People didn't really have love. They were all over the place. But not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. Now, this is maybe, maybe a message that we can relate to ourselves in this time of lockdown and being um, taken out of a lot of what we're used to, what we're comfortable with. Um, a time for us to, to really return to God and really to decide to be devoted to Him um, in everything and to return to His Word in this time. Um, they say in the, the, those who know Scripture, they say that these prophecies that Isaiah gives are mainly not to be applied so much to the world, society out there. So we're easily wanting to say, you know, in this time, you know, the world must, must reach to the world and change the world. But we get encouraged that the church first applies to ourselves, us turning to God, us being those those true witnesses and those um, effective witnesses for the Lord 
so that then from that place we can go and um, show it to the world and change the world as well. So that's the picture, that's the story of the book of Hosea. And, and I think just to conclude that before I want to go into a bit of um, worship or ministry time and just pray. What we see in this in this sermon is that Isaiah show, shows us that God desires our complete devotion. You know, there's pieces in there that he speaks about my heart um, turns and longs for you. And I just want you to love me and to know me. Um, it speaks about discipline being God's way to sanctify us as well. And that's not always a bad thing. John, we spoke about Jesus praying in 17 to verse 9 to 26. And there we saw that Jesus gave us his word to change us um, and to know him. That we can know him and we can believe him. And then also that the world should notice it. Um, if we're not hated by the world, they probably don't notice it. So a challenge for us to be noticed by the world, be um, seen as different from the world because of our love. I think primarily. So I you know, thank you for this, for this time. I, I want to, what I really felt in my heart when we pray and when we, um, let's go and read this portion again, maybe. And when we think about witnessing and the joy of witnessing, that, that the reality is that there's a lot of condemnation. And I really strongly want to just kind of renounce any condemnation that, that God's children um, on ourselves. That the devil is a liar, is an accuser. And in this time, not just in this time, but for all Christians at all times, the devil comes and he wants to lie to us and say that we're not really saved. Um, you know, look at us, we're not. You're not really different. Your, your witness isn't really that effective out in the world. You don't really evangelize. You don't do this and that. And I just want to come and say that those are lies and we cancel it in the name of Jesus. You know, when we commit our lives to the Lord, when, 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 when we got born again, we got baptized, we got a new spirit inside of us. And that spirit in us, um, it's a spirit that's different from this world. And it's undeniable and it can't be changed, can't be taken away from us. We have a different spirit in us. I want us to believe that. And um, we've been baptized even. And there we, we made this declaration. And if you haven't been baptized, you know, contact the church and make a, make a plan if you want to devote yourself and show that just a symbol of your God's child, your life belongs to him. But this is really a time where we show that I want in my desires with everything that I have to drown everything else out and to live for Jesus, to live for God. So you've done that. If you've done that, you have that, if, if you've made that once and for all, that decision. But the truth, what is the truth? And not a lie is that we are still being sanctified. None of us are perfect um, yet. And his word will sanctify us. And, um, and that's a joyful thing. It's a beautiful thing. That God's word reminds us who he is. And that it changes us. It's his spirit and it's his word that changes us. And if there's anything, if there's one thing I can um, leave with us. You know, it's not to try and um, be better. and yeah, we can't be self-righteous, but if we can, I think there's, there's a few areas where the witness of, of Christians gets damaged most, and that is, one is hiding our witness, putting it under a bushel, and that's not that you are not saved, it just means it's part of still having imperfectness in us, and really having to press in more to overcome that fear of man and to witness um, 
So hiding it, and then the other side is, is being hypocritical, making trying too hard and trying to be too perfect um, out of ourselves. And Jesus even went against those religious leaders who were so hypocritical of being so right in everything they do. Um, and we all can see through that as well. Um, but really, I think what we can just, just um, in this time is to devote ourselves to a new just um, commit and to decide and to choose to be fully committed to the Lord, to give Him everything that we have. And then the joy, the joy is that we are co-workers, Christ is our co-worker. And as we're fully devoted to Him, not hide it, not to try and be perfect, but just to be ourselves, just to be real and genuine. Jesus comes and he forgives and he comes and he um, pulls us in in our shortcomings. And that's the joy, that's our Christian liberty, people. That's, that's the redemption that we have. That we are free. We don't need to pretend. We can love, be glad. And um, with that joy and peace, I want to leave you and say, may we witness joyfully out there in the world. God bless you. In Jesus' name, I just want to pray for us. Father, may we, in this time, Lord, the last while that we have in lockdown, and things are different, Lord, the world speaks about a new era, that things will never be the same again, and there's doubt and all these things, Father, and we want to show that we have our hope, we have our faith, and we have love for people around us. We know, Lord God, there's so much selfishness inside us still, there's so much um, fear in ourselves still, even though we we are children, Lord God. Father, thank you that you, you didn't call a perfect church. You called us to be made perfect. And Lord, that this morning that we can commit again to say, Lord, we want to know you more. Know you. We want to be reminded by your word all the time. That you are changing us. And we want to do it, Lord, as our um, reasonable service unto you, Lord God, to continue want to worship and to witness of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Brothers, by donkey, thank you for the word and for your encouragement and for sharing scripture with us. Uh, powerful stuff there. Um, I think uh, just such a reminder again that, um, that we are called by God. We are set apart for him. And I love what you said about, you know, that he's given us his word and that we can bank on that. You know, there's a lot of these things in, in life that we cannot bank, uh, but that we can fully trust and rely in what God is saying to us at this time. So um, uh, just a comment from my side about Hosea. I think what inspires me about Hosea, I mean, you know, it's on the one side crazy how God asked his prophet to um, to marry a prostitute and everything that goes and, and around that. But you know what inspires me so much and which I believe is very applicable to each one of us at this time is just how God through that process is all about pursuing his people. And this love that he has for them, that he is not wanting to let them go. It doesn't matter how many times they, they, they make mistakes or falter or anything. He's just all about getting to them. And he wants to make sure that he wants to draw them closer to him. And just that love relationship, it is just such a beautiful picture of how God just continually pursues us. You know, and we make mistakes, uh, but God never stops pursuing us. Um, we just want to quickly share a couple of words that came through um, uh, from our leaders um, that they just sent through from the time of worship. Uh, so I'm just going to ask Laurie just to play. There's two voice notes and then a couple of scriptures. So just hang in there with us. We're just going to play that quickly. Of, of each of us walking on our own separate staircase um, that is going upwards to a purpose that the Lord has for us and the Lord showed me some of us um, yeah we are walking on this on the staircase and the devil comes and he takes away one of the stairs and immediately we we see the gap and we think to ourselves 
okay, it is not possible anymore to, to go upwards because there is in the stair anymore. But the Lord is telling me that if we spend quality time with Him, if we pray, if we spend time in the Word and just worship His, his name, and um, it, it won't be necessary to, to go into the gap. We can actually skip that gap, skip that where that, where that stair was. We can skip that gap and go to the next stair because we are strong enough now. But if we don't spend time with, with the Lord, we, we will be um, not weak, but not capable to overcoming that gap. But if we yeah, spend time with the Lord and pray and quality time and spend time in the Word, we will be able to overcome that gap and go onwards to the, the purpose that the Lord has for each of us. Uh, so, I think, uh, I think uh, just something that stands out for me is not to, not to focus on the next step, not to focus on the missing step. But to focus on God and just pursue Him, and then you will be strong enough to overcome. Right? A word from us. I just had a while we were worshiping here um, in the field. Just had two pictures here. Um, the one is um, of a little karub bush that seems almost dead. Um, it seems like the animals have trampled on it and eaten most of it up and, and the drought has just um, caused it to almost die. Um, but when you come closer, there's, there's just just a sign of life in that little bush. Um, and I, I'm not sure exactly for, for whom this is, but um, if, you are, if you are listening this morning and, and feel like you are completely dried up and, and just... Um, ready to die of drought, um, whether it's spiritually or um, emotionally or even in a, in a, in a natural, um, financially, whatever the case may be. Um, but if you feel like you're completely dried up, um, this morning God wants to say to you that there is life. Um, and it, even if it, if it doesn't seem much, but there is still life in you and, and God is the one who sends rain and sends a provision for that little karubush to start to grow again and to to be um, food for the animals. Um, so, so God is sending the rain. Um, it is coming. Um, that is the encouragement that I, that I have. And as long as there's a little bit of life, the moment the rain, only a little bit of rain falls, that bush will start to grow again. It's not dead. And then the other thing is... Um, at the same time, um, I also saw all the rocks, and I was just reminded of that scripture where um, Jesus said that if if, um, yeah, if we are silent, if the people um, are, are not praising him, the, sh the, the, the stones will start to shout out. Um, and that was quite an emotional moment for me where I just realized that, that even these stones that seem dead, will cry out and, and, and um, lift up his name and worship him. So I just want to encourage everyone this morning that um, God is alive. And if, if, we are, if we are silent, the stones will cry out. Can I just pray for those people that are feeling like that this morning? Um, Father, we just pray for everyone who's experiencing that the dryness and, and even feel like they are dead, Lord God, that there's no life. I thank you for your word this morning, Father, that just uh, speaks forth life in, 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 a, in a being. And I pray, Father God, even the seed that was sown, the, the, of the seed of your word that was sown in the past will start bearing fruit, Father. That we will see that grow, that they will experience it grow, Father. And as they look to you, as they do not look to the circumstances, as they do not look to the drought and the external conditions, Father God, that they will uh, just see your spirit touching them and experience your spirit touching them and that, that life will come. Father, your word is clear that you will make the rivers in the desert, Father, God, a way where there is no way, Father, God, that you will show yourself strong. Thank you, Lord, that, that you, the almighty God, to nothing is impossible, will touch each one of these people's lives, Father. And I thank you, Lord, that they will bear much fruit, that life will spring forth, Father God, that, Father, we will see new life just coming out, even... In this difficult time, Father, I just thank you that life comes into their being 
joy. I just want to speak joy over you. Release God's joy over you in the name of Jesus. You know, scripture says that we need to put on a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I just pray, Father, that that garment of praise will now, they will put it on. Father, even in this situation, even in despite their flesh and the, 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 the thoughts that they have, Father God, that they can put on a garment of praise and worship you. And that that spirit of heaviness will leave them. A joy will come. Fruit will come. Life will come. We thank you that it's there and that you bring it forth in Jesus' name. We give you praise, Father. Amen. Just a few scriptures. I'm going to start with one from Yulan, Yulandi, Psalm 46, verse 10, which is this. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Amen. And then um, one from Cheslin, Isaiah 58, verse 12. And your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Um, and I've got one here from Benny, um, also from Isaiah, Isaiah 43, verse 16 to 19. that says, this is what the Lord says. You makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters. He who brings out the chariot and the horse, the army and the mighty warrior, they will lie down together. They will not rise again. They've been extinguished. They have been put out like a lamp's wick. Do not remember the former things or ponder the things of the past. Listen carefully. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? It will even put a road in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Yeah, that's a very well-known scripture. And, um, you know, I think for us, we can just with expectation <laughs> wait on this God who's about to do amazing things. So, so yes, exciting times. Uh, maybe you can just write down Isaiah 65, verse 17 to 25 as well. It's a very long scripture, so I'm not going to read it now. But um, I want to encourage you to read it when we've got some ministry time. Isaiah 65, verse 17 to 25. And then I've got one more from um, Nandi as well. Um, from Exodus 2, verse 1 to 9, it says, And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could uh, no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, doped it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it and laid it in the reeds of the rivers, river banks. And his sister stood far off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when he saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew woman that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Um, also, um, this comes from Nandi, also saw the picture of the Red Sea opening and before that in worship reminded of the peace where Moses was hidden in the river. God, through the Egyptians that made the rule to kill the Israelite sons, brings the salvation of Moses and thus ultimately the one that will lead Israel to the promised land. I think we can maybe pray into this, also feel it is an encouragement where it appears to be impossible, God still makes a way for his plan to prevail. Amen. So clearly God is saying to us at this time that um, he's making a way, he's, he's, he's breaking through into our situation and that we should not get discouraged with our current circumstances, but that we should firmly fix our eyes on him, knowing that he is the God Almighty. He will do incredible things in our lives and he will break through into our situation. And can we just expect God, can we with joy expect God to just, do amazing things in our lives. Whatever your circumstances are, whatever your, your fears are, just give those things to, to God and expect Him 
to arrive, to pitch, to show himself strong on your behalf at this time.